Let's begin this week by reviewing some key principles. Principle number one, that God desires ministry to be in the hands of the entire body of Christ. Not just in the hands of the pastors, but of every believer. Remember Paul says in Ephesians 2.11, and he, Jesus, gave some as apostles and some as prophets, some as evangelists and some as pastor teachers. For what reason? For the equipping of the saints. That's all of us who are in Christ. And what are the pastors to equip us for? For the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. You see, ministry is all of our responsibility. God has a place of significant ministry for you. Principle number two, God has a particular role he wants each of us to perform. He has created us and shaped us with different mix of personalities and talents, natural abilities and experiences, and spiritual gifts, so that we can be used in a very unique way in the ministry to the body of Christ. And our goal in this series is to help you discover what your spiritual gift is, so you can better understand how God wants to use you. In Acts 6, 1-7, we read the story about the early church. It, it, remember, it just exploded. They had 3,000 people convert in one sermon. And the church was just blowing up. And there was a lot of needs to be met. And one of those needs were caring for the widows, distributing food to the needy. Some of the widows were being overlooked. And it created this whole big commotion. People were crying out discrimination. So the report got back to the apostles. And Peter wisely said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostles were not saying that they were too good or too important to be serving tables. But that it was not desirable. It wasn't convenient. Not convenient for the apostles to try to do all the ministries. After all, they had to be teaching. It wasn't convenient because the rest of the body would be missing out on the blessing and learning how to serve others. It wasn't convenient because God's will was that other people and all of us would be used and use our gifts in the ministry to one another. Principle number three, and I want you to pick up on this that those who are productive in their lives have set priorities in their lives. Productivity and priorities go hand in hand. So if we want to be productive, we have to set priorities. See, we tend to equate spirituality with activity. But you know what? Increased activity is not always indicative of spirituality, but of a loss of priorities. You know, one of the most active creatures in the world that I know of is a chicken who's had its head severed. See, it has all this activity, feathers, and it's flopping around and moving about, but its activity is indicative that it's been separated from its head. And when I start running around doing all kinds of things and, and it's so busy, I have no time really to do anything well, it's indicative that I've lost contact with my head, Jesus. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. There's a silent supposition that ministry is to be hard and burdensome. But you know what? The Lord says, no, I don't want to burn you out. The key is to discover how the Lord has formed you so you can focus your efforts and do what he's made you, created you to do. We learned last week that there's three categories of spiritual things. Remember? There's manifestations. These are supernatural ways in which God reveals himself to a person or persons. 
The list of these manifestations appear in 1 Corinthians 12. There's nine of them, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Now, these are not things that people can do at their will and whim, but these are things that come and go as the Lord sees fit. And some of us may never see one manifestation in our lives, and that's okay. They're not a sign of being spiritual. They are simply supernatural way God reveals himself in a situation to a particular person or persons. Secondly, there's ministries. These are roles God gives to individuals to fulfill in the church for the edification and the advancement of the body of Christ. These ministries appear in Ephesians 4.11, apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. Thirdly, there's gifts. And this is the focus of our study. And I shared 10 characteristic of spiritual gifts. First of all, that spiritual gifts are not the same thing as the gift of the Spirit. Spiritual gifts are not the same thing as natural talents or abilities. Spiritual gifts are not the same thing as the fruit of the Spirit. Rather, spiritual gifts are given to every believer at salvation. Spiritual gifts can remain dormant and undiscovered for long periods of times. But spiritual gifts are given by God sovereignly. It's His choosing which one we get, not ours. Every Christian has one and only one of these spiritual gifts. And no one spiritual gift is superior to the other or more spiritual than the other. They're rather their inward motivation and supernatural means that each believer possesses to express and demonstrate love to the body of Christ. They're given to produce the life of Christ in every believer. Now, the list of spiritual gifts appear in Romans chapter 12, and there's seven of them, and only seven. So each one of us has one of these, and that's what we want to discover, which one the Lord has given us. But before we go into the discovery phase, I need to define what each one of them is so we understand them. So get your pencils out, okay? We're going to look through these gifts one by one. I'm going to give you a long definition and then a short definition. I'm going to give you some quick characteristics. And then I'm going to try to give an example of that gift being exercised in the scriptures. And then here's what I want you to do. In your notes, where it says, for example, prophecy. I want you to see underneath it has yes, no, maybe. And you're going to circle one of those options for each one. Now, we're going to go quick, so you need to buckle your seatbelt, okay? Uh, uh, By the way, when Peter talks about our gifts in 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, he categorizes our gifts into two groups. They're speaking gifts and they're service gifts, verbal and nonverbal gifts. And you will see how each one of the gifts we talk about today fall into one of these categories. Let's begin with prophecy. That's a divine enablement to proclaim God's truth with power and clarity in a timely and culturally sensitive fashion for correction, repentance, or edification. In short, it is declaring the truth to the body of Christ. You know, people oftentimes think about prophecy as foretelling the future. And that did happen occasionally, both in Old and New Testament. But by far, the role of prophet was to be a messenger of God, to speak the word of God. I count 466 times that the prophet says, thus says the Lord, or something similar. They spoke truth, God's truth, to God's people. In 1 Corinthians 14.3, we're given a definition of prophecy. The one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, to build people up, and exhortation, to pump them up, and consolation, to comfort them. They speak God's truth with power and clarity in a timely and culturally sensitive fashion for correction, repentance, or edification. Now, Now, clearly, this is a verbal gift, right? And one of the good tests of this are prophets are people who often intuitively are asking 
the question in every situation, what does God's word say about this? The best example I can think of of this gift is John the Baptist. We read in Luke 3, 2, that the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, verse 7. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to rise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Speaking uncompromising truth, that's a sign of prophecy. Verse 10, and the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. He who has food is to do likewise. Verse 12, and some of the tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Verse 14, and some of the soldiers were questioning him, saying, and, and, and what about us? What shall we do? Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Verse 18, so with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. See, John the Baptist is the epitome of one with this gift, preaching the truth uncompromisingly. The characteristic of one with, is they tend to be persuasive speakers. They tend to see things in black and white. They're passionate against sin and calling people back to repentance. So, do you think this describes you? Yes? No? Maybe? Gift number two, service. The key word here is the word diakonon. It's translated sometimes deacon, and it literally means to serve or to wait tables. So, service is the ability to demonstrate love by meeting practical needs that release other Christians for direct spiritual ministry. A short definition is exercising the truth within the body of Christ. See, the question these people intuitively ask because of this gift is, what can I do to help? What can I do? You know, a great example of a person with this gift was this gal in Act 9 named Dorcas. She's described as a woman who is abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. When she died, we're told the whole church was crying and mourning, and they called for Peter to come. Why were they mourning her so much? Was she a great teacher, a powerful prophet? <laughs> no, it says that the widows weep, showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. She was merely a servant. See, this is one of the least appreciated gifts in the body. Nobody seems to want to admit that they have the gift of service. Yet it's so important and needed. I would also venture to say that this is probably one of the most common gifts. When you go to your church this weekend, you, you don't see these people with their gifts necessarily. But they make things happen. Someone got there early. Someone turned on the light. Somebody cleaned things up. Somebody folded the bulletin. Somebody typed something. Someone's watching the kids. Uh, someone fixed, you know, uh, the, the, the lights. Someone helped the single moms. Someone's doing repairs at night. All These are all kinds of people uh, that the Spirit of God uses. They're, they're, they're where the rubber meets the road practically, you know, uh, hero in my estimation. In fact, Paul says the more unseemingly less visible members is what we should exalt. That's this gift. It's clearly a non-verbal gift. And some of the characteristics of a person with this gift is they don't, 
want much public recognition. These people don't seek the limelight. They're, they're content working behind the scenes. They, they often like manual projects. Uh, they usually uh, have this ability to detect other people's personal needs. See, these are the kinds of people that walk into your house or there's a conversation and they come around later and they fix something for you. And you're thinking, how did you even know that I needed that, that that needed a fix? Well, when I came over, I saw that it was broken, so I decided to come and fix it. They're really attuned to meeting the practical needs of people. And that's how they show and express their love. These people are able to be to overlook personal discomfort in order to meet other people's needs and will often use their own funds to make things happen because they simply want to serve. Is that you? Yes. No. Maybe. Gift number three, teaching. This is the one that everyone seems to want, but it's not most common. You can't have a church full of teachers. I mean, who would be learning, right? Teaching is the divine enablement to understand and give detailed explanation of biblical truth. It's the ability to search out and validate truth that has been presented. Now, the classical Greek word used here is to impart information in order to develop talent and potential. It's the motivation and power to present with clarity the truth of the word of God. So a short definition of this gift is explaining the truth to the body of Christ. People with this gift are often asking, what does that mean? How does that apply to life? People with the gift of teaching, you know, they love to do research. They love to study. They like to study down to the, to the minutia. I mean, stuff that most of us would think is unimportant. You know what? They love it. And they're the people that make all those long charts and pictures and graphs. When you have a gift of teaching, uh, you, 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 you love doctrine, you love research, you love the study. These are the kind of people who, who you know, they, 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 when, you're te- when they're listening to teaching, lights are going on like crazy and they're ding, 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 you know, is that true? And oh, how about that? And oh, where did I get that? And what about this? And, and you know, and their mind is constantly going through the word and wondering and studying and going deeper and deeper. The best example would probably be Jesus. I mean, actually, he's the best example of all the gifts. He's the only man that's ever possessed all of them. So we can find Jesus exercising every one of the gifts. But now that he's gone to heaven, and we, all of us, are the body of Christ, we have one. So we're to focus and link ourselves to other brothers to complete his body. But Jesus was the best teacher. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is teaching his disciples, and over and over again he says, You have heard it said, but I say to you. In other words, let me clear things up for you. And several times we're told that after Jesus spoke that people were amazed because they understood him and that he was one that spoke with authority. See, teachers, these guys make the Bible clear for all of us to understand. And obviously, it's a verbal gift. So, is that you? Yes? No? Maybe? Gift number four, exhortation. This is the divine enablement, or power, to come alongside another in need of encouragement to reassure, strengthen, affirm, and challenge those who are discouraged or wavering in their faith. It's the ability to stimulate the faith of others. A short definition would be they encourage the body of Christ with the truth. See, people with this gift are always asking what must be done to fix this. They're fix-it people. And then next, how can we move these people or this person to wholeness? This gift of exhortation, the biblical word, you know, when it says there was another comforter would come, referring to the Holy Spirit, the word there is para 
Cleal alongside, para is alongside, Cleal called, to be called alongside. This word, that's what exhortation means, is a person that's called alongside others to encourage, to help, to build up. And it's a phenomenal gift. People with this gift see practically how to apply the scripture and the truth to your life. They call us to godly living. They initiate, they implore, they request, they entreat. These are great people to have as friends. A great example of this was Barnabas. Actually, his name meant son of encouragement. And he was constantly finding ways to encourage people through his words as well as through his actions. For example, in Acts chapter 4, we see how he gave some land to be sold to help the needy in the church. He was encouraging them in their poverty by showing love to them. Then in Acts 9, when no one wanted anything to do with this Saul of Tarsus because they didn't trust him, he was a persecutor. Barnabas brought him under his wing and accepted him and believed in him and began to teach him. Then in Acts 13, initially we see Barnabas as the leader of the missionary group. You know, it's Barnabas and Paul, Barnabas and Paul. But suddenly things change in Acts 13, where it begins to say Paul and Barnabas. Again, the encourager is stepping aside and letting his disciple take the reins in the leadership. In Acts 15, we see Barnabas sees a potential in another young man named John Mark, and he brings him alongside to encourage him and disciple him. See, encouragers are great disciplers, great counselors. So how about you? Gift of exhortation? Are you motivated to ask, how can I bring people to wholeness? Yes, no, maybe. Gift number five, giving. This is the divine enablement to wisely contribute to the work of the Lord with cheerfulness and liberality. See, it's the ability to entrust personal assets to others for the furtherance of their ministry. People with this gift are often asking the question, what can I give to meet the needs? What can I give to meet the needs of others? The Greek word here is to share or to give. It's not necessarily money, but primarily, and it shows up in people's finances. But this is a person with generosity. So a short definition would be they support the truth or they help expand the truth of the body of Christ. What are some characteristics of the gift of giving? Well, these people don't like the limelight. These people like to give anonymously. These people like to have a single focus. They do not have to be wealthy. You know, obviously this gift is operating in the third world. You can have the gift of giving in Haiti and you may not have but two coconuts, but you're willing to give one and a half of yours away to another, okay? So does this describe you? Yes, no, maybe. Gift number six, administration. This is the divine enablement to see what needs to be done, to set goals and then attract, organize, lead, and motivate people to accomplish the work of the ministry. See, it is the ability to coordinate the activities of others for the achievement of common goals. See, these people organize the truth for the body of Christ. People with this gift are always asking, well, what is our goal? What are we trying to do? What's the target that's on the wall? It's interesting. In terms of definition, this is a person who gives a vision and direction, can mobilize others. It originally has the idea of someone who, who stands in front, is the ability to lead and to delegate. They, they'll take charge. They enjoy responsibility. This is the guy who wants to take the shot, the, 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 the last shot of the game. And if he misses, hey, he misses. But he wants the ball in his hands. When there's a vacuum and nothing's happening, a person with this gift of leadership is just frustrated to death. They see the disorganization, that it's going nowhere. What they want to do is say, look, if no one else is going to do this, 
okay, look, I'll tell you what. You seem to be good at this. You seem to be good at that. Let's come up with a plan. Let's put the target on a wall. And for the next six weeks, let's go for it. Does everyone agree? And they'll get everybody together. And everyone will say, oh, yeah, you know. And, and they'll, they'll, they'll team up and they will work together. And that's what the gift of leadership or administration's done. They'll stand up in front. It's a person who has the ability to see how things fit together what needs to be done, and how it can be accomplished. And they have a way of doing it. They're where people are attracted to them, and they see the big picture, and they mobilize them and get them in their strengths. Does this describe you? Are you a gift of leadership? Yes? No? Maybe? Gift number seven, mercy. Okay, I, I said the service was the least wanted gift. I, I, I was wrong. This is probably the least wanted gift. See, it is the divine enablement to minister cheerfully and appropriately to people who are suffering or undeserving and spare them the punishment or the consequences they justly deserve. It's a wonderful gift. They demonstrate the truth to the body of Christ. These people are the heart of every ministry. These are those people that you've blown it. I mean, you've really blown it. And, and you could blame others, but it's really your fault. But something in them not only wants to help you, but they, they don't want you to suffer the consequences that you really ought to get. Kind of like God, huh? It's a gift of mercy. It's a gift of wanting to withhold just consequences from those who rightly deserve it. And they're always asking the question, how can, what can I do to make them feel better? There's a high identification with people's hurts and with people's needs and what they're going through. The definition of the word mercy at the heart of it as an emotion that is aroused by the afflictions or the needs of others that gets translated into action. There's just something in the heart, that this, this, this compassion, this sympathy and empathy that wants to reach out and help people. The characteristics of the gift of mercy is they're able to detect and discern people's feelings. I mean, have you ever been there where you're with someone with the gift of mercy and, and actually, you know, you're talking and you, you go through a meeting and you think, wow, you know, that was a great meeting. And you walk out and you walk out with the someone with the gift of mercy and, and, and they're like, hey man, we really need to pray for that guy. And you're like, why? I, I thought it was a good meeting. Oh, you didn't pick up on it? You're like, pick up on what? Man, his marriage is in trouble. What do you mean that his marriage is in trouble? We weren't talking about marriage at all. Uh, we were trying to get, you know, a building built. But didn't you pick up on the signals? He said and this and he said that. And when you asked about his family quickly, then he went around and he shared and his countenance fell and, and why not? That they're perceptive. These people, they've got this antenna. They've got this radar. And when there are needs and when there are hurts and when they're, they pick up on it. And then they're drawn to it and they want to help and they want to care. And the characteristic here, not only do they detect and discern, they're very sensitive. They're sensitive to the point of action. Well, those are the seven motivational gifts. Someone rightly said that a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think they got it right. So let me give you a picture. Suppose I'm at church and I'm up in front preaching and my son Nathan sees that my throat's a little parched and he decides to come and bring me a cup of water. But as he's walking up to me, somebody gets in his way, he stumbles, he drops the glass, it breaks, it shatters, water falls all over the place, he falls on his face. How would you respond? 
Those are prophecy would say, Nathan, listen, uh, the world's, world's full of pitfalls and you got to be careful how you walk. You got to walk straight and on the path. And they would give him a powerful preaching uh, to try to meet poor Nathan's needs. I would say, oh, Nathan, I I'm sorry. Don't, don't listen to him. Don't feel bad. I've done that too and would find a way to comfort him. Those with the gift of service would say, oh, well, where's the broom? You know, I'll take care of that, Nathan. Don't worry. I'll clean up the mess. I'll sweep it up. You just relax. A gift of administration would question, well, well who put the stairs here? Oh, this was poor planning. You know, I, I don't even think these steps meet code. Get, get a measuring tape. We're going to see if these steps are the right height. Maybe that's the problem. A gift of teaching would sit Nathan down and say, you know what, when you bring a glass of water, the first thing you need to do is you need to wipe all the excess water from the outside of the glass. Then you need to apply 20 pounds of pressure to the glass. And you need to carry it in this fashion. And they would give a great explanation on how to carry a glass of water so that it doesn't fall. The gift of giving would say, hey, how much did the glass cost? How much is the cleaning of the carpet going to cost? I'll cover it. And that's the body. They all look at the same event, but they see it in different ways. And that's how the body of Christ is to work. I believe that God has given everyone in this room a gift. Which one of those seven did you most resonate with? If you were at that, at that scenario, what would you naturally jump up to do? How would you resolve Nathan's problem? I tell you what, God wants you to walk in the good works that he has ordained for you from the foundation of the earth, that you should do those good works. And I'm going to tell you, when, when you do, you're going to get that double F in your life. Unbelievable fulfillment and unbelievable fruitfulness. Did you get maybe just a tiny little inkling that maybe what we read here today, one of them applies to you. Maybe you found two or, or three of them kind of resonated, but you're not sure. Well, don't worry. Next week, we're going to discover which one is our gift. But I want you to know that God has gifted you. He has molded and he has a plan and a purpose and significant ministry in store for you. So let's go on and we'll discover that beginning next week.